Welcome everyone, I'm Anju Baraya. I'll be co-facilitating this session along with my colleague, Jesse. In this session, we have William Stridham with us along with Marsha, Padmini, Janet, and Jason for panel discussion on the impact on the Agile Manifesto. William is an integral Agilist, professional coach, and leadership developer. He is currently spreading the joy of Agile software development and agility across teams, departments, and organizations. You will have the opportunity to answer and interact with other audience members via virtual whiteboard at the same time. The link to the whiteboard has been posted on the Q&A session chat. Please grab that link and log into Mural Board. I'll hand it over to William. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Um, and as we said, this session is all around the Agile Manifesto and you. Um, and if you're not sure about the Agile Manifesto, you probably know with Alistair talking this morning already and all of us unpacking it even more. Um, and on the whiteboard, you'll notice we will uh, let you interact with each other there. So you don't just have to listen to us talking the whole time. And with this, I do want to introduce the panel and actually ask them each to introduce themselves. So whoever is ready to go first can introduce yourself and just pass it on to the next person. I'll go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Padmini Nidamolu, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm an enterprise transformation coach uh, by profession, and I co-founded an initiative called Lean and Agile for Women. Um, that's by passion. And um, the intent of our organization is to truly raise the floor for all women in lean and agile spaces so we can come together, support each other, offer to the group and seek from the group in a psychologically safe setting. Uh, I, have, I have started Agile years, years ago and um, you know, worked across the industries and I interacted with amazing people that you're seeing here and beyond. And I'm totally looking forward to um, this festival and hope to interact with you all to learn from each other. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Marsha. <laughs> so I'm Marsha Acker. I'm um, here in Maryland, uh, where we're getting some version of sleet and freezing rain, I think, like everybody else today. Uh, I am, so I'm the CEO of Team Catapult. I also just released a book in January called The Art and Science of Facilitation, um, about leading collaboration in Agile teams. And uh, I came to Agile in 1999. I've been doing a lot of reflection on that journey this week um, in preparation for this conference. Uh, and I guess one, um, one gratitude that I shared last night was uh, about the opportunity to be one of the track co-founders uh, at IC Agile for the Agile team coaching track and then the enterprise coaching track. So it's nice to be here. So I'm gonna um, pass it to Jason. Hi. My name is Jason Hall, and I'm a business agility product coach mm -hmm. um, who started uh, started my journey uh, maybe about 10 years ago in the product, I'm sorry, in the agile space, uh, having been in the IT space for several years before then, wandering around aimlessly. Um, and I experienced agile firsthand uh, as a product owner on a team, uh, shifting from requirements manager to product owner. Um, and it was that, that experience over several years working with this wonderful team um, that led me to want to coach uh, in that way, in that sort of mindset and space. Mm -hmm. and, and since then, I've sort of moved with a particular focus on, on the product side. Uh, my company is Collaborative Structures. And my focus and aim primarily is uh, helping others uh, uh, move to a more outcome-driven approach. Uh, to uh, their strategy and their their organizational structure. All right, and I do believe that leaves us to Jeanette. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Jeanette Howell. I am from the U.S. Virgin Islands, but I'm currently living in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I have been practicing Agile since 2014. I am currently a safe program consultant and an Agile coach at General Motors, where I spend most of my time leading collaborative efforts across our organizations to implement an agile transformation. 
I'm also a member of the Agile Alliance's Agile in Color initiative, where we strive to create spaces for and spotlight global people of color in the Agile community. And I'm looking forward to this amazing discussion with my fellow panelists. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, so we're gonna shift gears and start talking about the manifesto. And uh, the questions I've got is kind of loosely based based on appreciative inquiry um, and they also in the whiteboard. And that's why we'll start first off with, let's discover, we'll do, a little, do a little bit of discovery. Whew, I don't fall over my own voice there. Um, so the first question I'm gonna pose to the panelists is, what attracted you to the manifesto when you first discovered it? Who wants to go first? I don't want to be the first all the time. <laughs> we're, we're politely waiting to, to, to take turns. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one only because it, it, uh, it sort of is a nice tale from my, my introduction. And, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, it was, it was through experience first. It was, it was actually through uh, participating. I remember participating in that role for a while before I'd even been educated or enlightened about, oh, by the way, the, like, these are the things that, um, um, these are the things that are binding by what you are experiencing right now. Um, and, and so it was, it was, it was awesome. It was great. It was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, uh, and, and, and that was a, I think that was a pleasure. I, I know many folks approach it the other way, right? It's their organization or their group, their team, whatever are moving and thinking about moving from one place to another. And then, so they, they come about. Uh, they've, they've probably heard about Agile by now, right? You, you can't miss it. You know, it's, it's a constant moving train. Um, so, you know, so I, I think I had that, that luxury. So it was like, well, of course I like this. This is, this is what, what I'm, what I'm doing this. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Let's, let's have more of that. So. Yeah, I'd say I first fell in love with it. Actually, I became a certified Scrum Master just because um, my previous company was, they were just offering certifications. So I just wanted to see what it was about. Um, but I actually attended a conference called Agile and Beyond in Ann Arbor. And that was actually my, my big introduction into the Agile Manifesto and the values that come from it. Um, the main thing that attracted me to the manifesto is the psychological component behind the principles and value. So my background is in software engineering and industrial assistance engineering. I work with engineering teams. However, I have a, a real keen interest in this in psychology and how do people think, how do they interact. Um, to me, the manifesto pulls forward and brings that to the, the, the forefront, you know, team building, customer centricity, constant communication. And by bringing that to the forefront, we are also bringing joy and empathy. And so for me, that remediates a lot of the issues I've seen in my company or at different companies where there's that constant throwing things over the wall, the never ending blame game. And so for me, um, that's the biggest thing that attracted me to, to the manifesto, the psychological component behind of it. I feel like I was on a... Um... Uh, listening to Alistair talk this morning, I was I was geeking out on I, every one of those people. I their books are up on my shelf. Like so, in the 90s, I was I was deep into that process in software engineering. I think for me, the one of the things that resonated. So I came to facilitation in 94. Um, and then extreme programming. So, so we started playing around with those index cards around tables, and I saw that as a, I saw that as a doorway to facilitation, not just uh, you know developing software. But it, I think the thing, the chord that it really struck with me was it was introducing the people side of it. Um, it, it was like a doorway into talking about the human aspect of it. And I had spent five years just trying to bridge getting. Uh, using facilitation to bridge end users and developers, like, you know, getting people to come to the table and talk together. So I don't know, it felt like this was opening that doorway in a really different way. So it resonated at a, at a DNA level for me. Cool. Collaboration people. Yeah. So next question, what has worked well for you from the manifesto? I think I can uh, add to that, right? Um, I think what worked really well 
and I believe will always work for um, you know a, a software development project or even across the business is the way it establishes people over processes component. I was a project and program manager in my past life and it was all timelines, go, 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 right? Where are we? And we are slipping the budget. So, you know, how do we report it? It was all very, um, I would say, um, you know, dictatorial, you know, in other words. And I, I think what Manifesto actually did for me was, you know, giving space to the developers, to the teams, to breathe, to be creative and to really be themselves so they can be at their best and produce great products and services, right? I think that was the key for me. And it was also one of the values, which is, you know, build the software or in fact, you know, deliver your products around motivated individuals, right? There is an intrinsic motivation and it's not always the paycheck. It is about that feel good factor of I have done this, but you know, did this with um, high integrity and high productivity. I think, you know, as, as Jeanette was mentioning, it is the psychological factor, it is the human to human factor. Um, I think that's what really, uh, you know, um, brings value to this, to this manifesto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd say in the same breath um, that that principle that uh, really resonates with me. Um, what has really worked well for me is taking a moment to pause and continuously reflect on what is it that I am doing. You know, I, earlier this week I was in a leadership discussion, and I, you know, being the subject matter expert, I was trying to push push something onto the the rest of the the leaders, but I had to stop and tell myself, you know, let me take a step back. How am I guiding my team? How am I guiding in this conversation? Is this the most valuable path forward? So it gives me an opportunity to stop and reflect on my actions and what am I doing? And instead of trying to push or, or lean someone in, in one direction, I, take a, I get to take a step back and say, is this the right path forward? Or what is it that I'm not getting that, that, they're, they're, that is causing them to be reluctant on, on making this change? So um, the individuals and the inter and interactions over process and tools, um, that one really, really resonates with me. Cool. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna move us on to the third question. Um, what makes the Agile Manifesto valuable for you? I think we kind of, it's already coming out in some of the answers, but let's see if we kind of hone a little bit on, on, on that from working to what's really valuable. What would you answer to that? say probably um, the simplicity, right? It's, it's, it's pretty resolute. And, and yes, I'm sure we'll get to, you know, we, you know, how do we imagine it currently and evolving, but, you know, to, you know, in, in an age, in an environment where most businesses don't last more than six or seven years, um, it, it's pretty astounding that it's, it's, it's held strong and grown outside of the software space. Um, you know, so I, I think that's probably the, you know, I think that's really what's, what's valuable. I mean, there's certification and processes and tools and frameworks and all sorts of things you can get into, but the four values are, are easy to grasp uh, early on. They, they are the elevator pitch in and of itself. And, and so I think that uh, low barrier to sort of cognitive entry makes it easy to cross the bridge with many people who are not experienced with it. I, Jason, I, I totally resonate with what you're saying. I think there is a durability to, to this as a movement and the, the fact that we're talking about it 20 years later, it's, it was not something that popped up and became, uh, you know, something for five, five or six years. It's, mm -hmm. it's had a, a stickiness to it. And I, and I think it's because of values and simplicity and, it's easy to see yourself in it. It's easy to see what you might want in it. Um, and then there's lots of room for all different instances and variations of what it might look like in practice. So I'm gonna move us on to the next question. Uh, this one is, well, sorry, it's a little clunky, but bear with me as I get this one out. 
Um, how has the manifesto made a positive impact on you and the people you work with and the organizations that we serve or that you serve? What would you say to that? Yeah, I can, um, I can share my experiences with it, right? As I said, when I was initially transitioning from a typical waterfall to agile ways of working, I think one thing that really anchored us all, grounded us all was the manifesto, right? It is easier for coaches or scrum masters or really any change agent to kind of bring these um, concepts in and have a conversation with the teams and leadership. That's one thing. But to have a manifesto, which has been well thought through, established and socialized and well accepted by the community in your hand to kind of refer to at a particular situation or given a scenario was extremely valuable, right? And I think it's, it's not just a positive impact, it was a profound impact. And at the very beginning, I would say, in I think it was in 2003, 2004 timeframe when this was brand new, still brand new, right? I think the industry was getting warmed up to it. And that was a time when it was difficult to have these conversations because people would just brush you away, mm-hmm. right? The timeline still mattered, the budget still mattered and you know, teams mattered less or the psychologically, psychological safety mattered less. I think that was when I could really hold on to the manifesto and and we had huge printouts stuck on the hallways. So it was easy for us to have the conversation, remember that value or, you know, look at that principle and this is how we all can collaborate. So it was easy to reference back to it, but also it was real in front of us all the time. So I think it was, it was a great tool for conversations and to get the point across. So I would use it as that, um, even today, really. Anybody wants to go next? Yeah, I, I can. I can go next. Um, you know, kind of on that same the same basis. My when my team was going through the waterfall um, process. I just knew that there was a way to, to do this better. better, And the Agile Manifesto was really that, that key way in how we can transform our, not only just our team, but our organization. And so um, I remember when I was very early in my career, I, um, after coming from a conference, I, I got into a, a boardroom with one of my, my colleagues and we just mapped out how we can change this process. What can we do? We presented it to our, our leaders. And at that time, like I mentioned, I was, just a junior employee so it was kind of like yeah okay nice nice effort nothing nothing really came of it but then you can once I started seeing um, that cause for okay we need to implement persistent teams which is agile teams we need to get everyone onto the same working work management process once I started seeing those changes happening I'm like okay great I can get myself involved in, in these initiatives because I know or I can see that this will help us to get to where we need to be as far as transforming our organization to get work out faster, um, get um, get alignment, get more collaboration between our organization and other organizations. So currently right now we're midway through our transformation and I can see now that people are collaborating, people are more comfortable sharing their, their ideas. There's a lot more transparency and I know that there's a lot a, a long path ahead of us, but it's amazing to see this work um, showing, coming to the forefront mm-hmm. as, as early as it is. Cool. Excellent. Uh, next question, the last one in the discovery phase is, what emotion does the manifesto evoke for you at the moment? That's an easy one for me. I it, It's been gratitude, and I think it's... Um, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I got involved and I'm grateful for the self-learning journey that I have had as part of it. For me, it's always been the um, curiosity, right? Uh, I think I'm yet to experiment on some of the values and see the impacts 100%, right? It's always, it works, it doesn't work. You know, it's a great success in one team or one portfolio. It's an utter failure in the others. 
I think, you know, we, we mix and match so many elements that, you know, the final product is always different. So it was always the curiosity for me. Um, but one thing I can say for sure is, um, you know, my curiosity was always fed with a situation, right? You know, or, or a need to kind of experiment and feed into that curiosity. But yeah, curiosity was definitely, um, you know, the emotion and it continues to be the emotion for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat a little bit because I've got simplicity. I've got curiosity. I've got complexity. Um, I've got eagerness. All of those things are running through my mind. Uh, the simplicity, I, I sort of talk about the curiosity. Um, uh, now, you know, it, it used to be, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I, I'd say it was uh, it was more eagerness, right? Because any organization that you approach, it was, for the most part, it was a f first time, first pass. What is this? And it was sort of like, let's get started. Uh, well, now the, the shine has faded a little um, in, in that, you know, for most organizations, for coaches that coming in, it is not the first time that they've dabbled in Agile. Most likely they are already in the middle of something, Um Right. So, you know, it, it is, it is now, okay, well, well, how does that, how do we go from wherever you are now to where you're trying to go? Um, and then, you know, I think, and then lastly, the eagerness on, well, yes. And uh, what, how, how 20 years from now, what parts of the manifesto are sort of hold steadfast and what parts probably could evolve to tackle the current situation and context and, uh, and environment that we're in now that we were in 20 years ago. So all of that is going through my head. Nice and good segue there, Jason. You kind of set us up was we kind of moving out of discovery into the dreaming phase. Like you were talking about the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the question that comes up here is, what is your high dream for the next 20 years as it relates to the manifesto? I think um, I've had several conversations about this <laughs> recently, so I'll share. And it's, it's a little bit, I would say, high dream, but also it's a bold dream, if I may share here, right? Mm -hmm. I think a couple of things. Yes, we do have individual interactions over processes and tools, right? That's about the interactions. Uh, it's also about the psychological safety, right? That might... Um, that might uh, need to be considered for manifesto. And maybe we should, we should all coach to the implicit inclusion of psychological safety, right? And also, you know, of course, this is about working software or build software around motivated individuals. And I think a great addition, again, we could coach to the implicit inclusion of this would be to build diverse teams. Right, uh, I, I think we are 20 years into the manifesto and it is time for us to take a very hard look at are our teams inclusive, truly inclusive. So yes, we have the values in place. Yes, we have principles in place. Yes, we have great organizations with their North Stars in place. Are we truly inclusive, right? I, again, I want to draw the uh, distinction between diverse and inclusion. You could have a diverse team. You could have a diverse leadership are we including them at the table, right? That would be my high dream, my bold dream to kind of um, start, start kind of preaching for it, coaching for it that, you know, let's, let's go beyond this and start talking about psychological safety and uh, have inclusive organizations at all levels. Really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know just coming from Alistair's talk about uh, him answering the question. Apparently, he gets a lot about why weren't there any women, and I can expand that to you know, why why weren't there any people of color and women in there. Um, but you know, I I think it's I'm looking forward more than looking back. And when I think about you know 20 years from now, if we were to sort of repeat that process, um, it would be great to now have uh, a diverse inclusion into those 
you know, many genius minds that come from, uh, from men, from women, from, from people yeah. of color, from people not of color and bring them to the table and imagine what that might look like. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think that's, you know, that's, that's exciting. I, I gave a whole talk uh, on, on one particular value yesterday and, and how I see that changing. I won't repeat that here. You can look up the video. Um, but, but I think there is, there is, there is a space for um, having that conversation again, especially as we consider you know, software to now permeate more deeply into our lives than, than it did 20 years ago. Um, I think that's, there's a new, like there's whole ethics considerations that, you know, we don't even really talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I, I, I'm, um, that's the eagerness part. You know, I'm, you know, I'm eagerly looking forward to that, something like that occurring. Yeah, and, and if we have time, I, I would like to also say like, I've always, I've always had a dream of, you know, while we're implementing this agile, you know, this agile change within our teams or at work, and et cetera. I love seeing people, you know, talk about how we can change our, our daily lives. So for instance, um, I watched Sally Alada's talk last night around um, how she was able to use agile or implement agile as part of her, the next generation of Sudan to help revolutionize an entire country. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've thought about, but not really. I'm like, oh, maybe one day that'll happen. But to look and, you know, listen to her presentation and see that's that's already happening. It really gives me hope for the next 20 years that we can begin to see this happening at, in, in many other countries around the world. Can What can I do within my community to, to make sure that we can use Agile to transform our, our policies and practices? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm going to move us on to the last, well, almost the last question I have, which is how might the Agile Manifesto make an even bigger impact in the future for you, the people and organizations you serve? It's kind of like similar. You've already, we, we kind of moved in this vein already, but let's see what, how can we bring that impact even higher? <clears throat> what would you say to that? I, well, I'll, I'll build on what everybody else is saying because there's, I share that dream, you know, and that high dream about diversity and inclusion. And, and I, I definitely hold a belief that that starts with leadership and the individual work that we do to create space for that, to, to become more aware of bias, to become more aware of how we, um, how we show up and how we include and how we unintentionally or intentionally, do, you know, exclude people. But I like my high dream about the manifesto is that it's a conversation taking place at the executive team, at the board level. Like I, it is, it is a pervasive norm. Um, and I think if I think there's so many um, initiatives and momentums in the corporate world, and I. I hold a belief when I really zoom out big and look at, I think the agile movement has had way more impact in organizational life than just about anything else. And I think it, it has the potential to do that in the next 20 years. I really do believe that it's community-based. Nobody owns it. Um, it is, it truly comes from passionate agilist there's so many stories about it being used in the social space uh, and things way outside of IT, HR, finance. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I wanna see it, I wanna see it grow. And I wanna see it be a norm for how leaders think about organizations. And I think leaders set the tone. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'd like to piggyback on that. I think well said, Marsha, right? It is about the shifting of the mindsets. It's not a tactical solution, right? It's not just about developing software, but I would say, you know, the biggest impact that, um, you know, the manifesto could have is to really shift the mindsets mm. and, and mean it and, and make it sustain, make it stick because most transformations, the so-called transformations fizzle out when the top leadership changes or the coaches leave. Right. Yeah. So how do we actually shift the culture of the organization as a whole from A to B? Right. And uh, I think that's the key. And that's the impact that the manifesto has a huge potential to impact on. So I'd like for it to be a value in use and not just an espoused value. I think that's mm -hmm. the rub. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. Any other thoughts before I, we go to do some Q&A questions, if there are any? Okay. Do we have any Q&A questions at the moment? I don't see right now. Folks, uh, please go ahead and enter any questions that you have for the panelists. But I see a lot of uh, inputs coming from people on the board. Yeah, there's very interesting things popping mm -hmm. up on the board there. Yeah. Uh, and what's recognizing there. And I do, I love where this is taking us. This is becoming, and there's a little under theme here that I'm seeing is like the manifesto is kind of like breaking out of the IT space into organizational space and also the, how we kind of change the world at the moment. Um, the EIB, I mean, that kind of is at the center of the, a lot of the things that we're working with these days. Um, and that equality, how do we treat each other all with equal? We all got equal voice. We all bear with that inclusion. Um, love the work that's happening and that all of you are doing. And it's something we all own. It's not somebody else's job. Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's our job. Yeah. Um, I do have one more question, which I'm going to unveil now because we I don't see any questions popping up yet, which is my final question. Uh, um, people on the virtual board, you've got to scroll down a little bit to get to it. And I'm just going to throw this out there. And let's see what our panelists say about this one is I've got, how agile do you need to be? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, this is like 20% more agile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 20% more and you're good. <laughs> and this is also like asking, um, you know, uh, Pavlo to um, how healthy do you need to be? Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a continuous journey, right? It is. And, uh, and not all uh, one size fits all. It is a continuous journey, continuous improvement. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is why I think I sometimes have trouble with the word transformation, which indicates that you have transformed. This is the yeah, nirvana, transition. right? I, even I like transition better, like we are moving in that direction and you actually never arrive because there's always so much to mm. work on, improve on, continuous improvement. It's always a part of it. Mm. And I, I read a, you know, a very powerful quote about Agile sometime back and it just stuck with me and, and we had it printed and um, published on our walls. Uh, for several years, which is, you're not an agile team if you're not better today than you were yesterday. Doesn't matter how perfect you were, doesn't matter mm -hmm. how great you were, you got to incrementally mm -hmm. improve each day, each increment, each sprint, whatever that increment is, right? So mm -hmm. Anju, as you said, um, it's, it's the continuous process, right? Because your uh, market is changing, your customer base is changing, requirements are changing constantly. We are in the VUCA world. So you can never be complacent that we got it. So I think uh, it's relative, uh, William, yeah. to that question. Yeah. yeah. We so do I have do some see... questions that popped up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but sorry, Anu, do you want to no, read no, them no. out? No, no, no. So I do have questions. I do see questions. Do you want me to read out those to you? Yes, please. Okay. What is the essence of Agile that will make uh, it in the norm for any organization? That will make it the norm for any organization. Can you repeat the first part again? Sorry. What is the essence of Agile that will make it the norm for any organization? Again, I would go back to the mindsets, right? I think that's the essence yeah. of Agile. It's the growth mindset. It's the mindset to adapt to change and uh, break down hierarchies. I would say that's the essence which will hopefully make it the norm for every organization because if you don't adopt that mindset, I think you know you lose the you lose the race or you know you lose the yeah. edge, competitive edge automatically. So I think that's the essence that, that yeah. organizations should adopt. Move from fixed mindset to growth mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So another question for each panelist in just a few words. Why transformation fail? Or why some people say Agile doesn't work? Mm. Oh. I, I think- Just um, a few words. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, just a few words, that's the hard part. 
Um, probably why they fail is in, in the question itself right there, because it's looked at as a transformation. Um, and there's a preconceived notion by whoever is, 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 is the, the catalyst for the transformation, the hire, the, uh, the sponsor, whatever, what that idea is um, that normally is not sort of settled upon and agreed upon. So that, that's first and foremost, right? They're, they're often thinking, oh, well, it means X and somebody else is thinking it means Y. And even if you get on that page, um, you know, there is what does success look like? If you, if you move a quarter of the way towards there, but you never arrive at what that agreed upon state, is that considered a failed transformation? Um, so yeah, I, I think first and foremost, right, we've, I think we've, as Agilis, I, I don't know, if, as whom, whomever started this, we dug ourselves into a hole when we hung our hats on this transformation idea. Um, in that, hey, this will be a this will sort of be a quick thing. Like, you just you just do this framework, or you uh, you know you you meet every day for fifteen minutes, and then um, magic, and and that's not really you know that's not that's not the case. So I, I think that's probably leading. That's one leading cause. The other that you know is is probably un well understood is that there's you know, leadership support. You can only do so much from a grassroots uh, perspective yeah. if you if you don't have the people that are supposed to be holding the space for you to perform and succeed actually bought in, so. I think that's so true. I, it, it's transformation isn't a project. And I think that's where so many organizations go south. It's not a project, it doesn't get a project manager. It doesn't have a start and an end date. Um, it doesn't have fancy posters. I, it's, it's just that, it becomes a norm. So. It happens in small increments every day. Everybody's doing their own work and their collective work. I think that's, I think that's where things have gone sideways and change. Mm -hmm. I will say um, one of my favorite quotes is the wise man knows that he knows nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And so that ties into um, what Padmini and, and Anju were saying when, you know, you have that in order to develop that mindset, you can't just watch a video and then you know implement it. What I've seen so far is that a lot of the times with with leadership and with you know any type of practitioner within the organization, sometimes they would go through the training and they'll be motivated and anxious to implement it, and then after a few weeks they revert back to well this is where I'm comfortable, this is where I want to stay, and so that's where I see things failing and going south. And so it's in order to make sure that we are constantly moving and progressing forward, we want to make sure that we can continuously learn and improve and, and take in and take on that, that agile mindset. Yeah, and to add, that, add to that, right, really quick, um, I think it will certainly fail when the transformation is brought into the organization, not for the true transformation, but for other purposes brought in by leaders, right? if they want to check mark that we have transformed for whatever intrinsic goals they have, that'll certainly fail, right? This needs to be assumed and owned by the entire organization, not by a group of leaders shoving you know, down the throats. So I think that's, that's the key. Thank you. We have two more questions and we are right on time. I think we can quickly deal with those. What is one of your favorite books that you would recommend? I can not anything. <laughs> <laughs> Marsha has a book, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, you would not go wrong with Marsha's books. I can watch for that. So, um, <laughs> no. yeah. But I'm I'm actually reading one now. I'm almost done, which is um, I think most of you probably read this, um, turning the ship around. Oh yeah, one of David Marquet. Yeah, right. And I love the concept of leader to leader versus leader to yes. follower concept that is just so tremendously powerful to um, really look at anybody and everybody as leaders and trusting that they can, right? Um, and when you, when you really trust and, and you know, make them uh, enabled, anybody can achieve anything. So uh, I'm loving the book. Thank you, Padmini. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I would say I know this was this was in vogue like a couple of years ago, and it's it's out. But if you missed it, it's still a great read. Uh, Reinventing Organizations by uh, Frederick Lou, especially if oh, you 
Mm-hmm. I'm not really very familiar with uh, integral systems thinking. It's a great kind of introductory into that. Yeah, that's my favorite book as well. It talks about teal organizations and everything. Great book. Any other recommendations? If not, then we are right on time, guys. It's 12.52. Thank you all so much for sharing the impact that Agile Manifesto had on you and all your dreams for that. Thank you, audience, for providing your inputs. It's nice to reflect and learn from each other. Thanks again. William will be sharing the PDF, right, William? Yes, I will. The whiteboard, I will export to a PDF and we will upload it into Hua. And thank you all for taking time during lunchtime and the panelists. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you guys around. We have uh, Lisa's session kicking kicking off at one. So see you guys there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.